Today we have John, Paul Johnsgaard here. He's an ornithologist, a bird expert at the university, and he's, he's just recently written a book for children called Prairie Children Mountain Dreams, and he's going to talk about that and dinosaurs today. Thank you. Yes, let's bring up a copy. I want to talk a little bit uh, early on about, uh, about animals, specifically about dinosaurs, and then maybe about how it came to be that I, I wrote this book. And then we'll get on and, and perhaps I'll read a little bit from it. Some of you have perhaps already read it, others of you may not know much about, about it. But I really am more a bird person than a, uh, than a dinosaur person. And uh, kids like birds too, but I think everybody, certainly I and my children, and just about all the kids I know go through a stage when dinosaurs are very interesting and, and very important to them. And so I've often thought that uh, it would be interesting to do a book in which uh, dinosaurs appeared, although unfortunately dinosaurs weren't around when children were around or vice versa, and it's a little hard to come up with, with a, a reasonable story that involves truly dinosaurs and kids. So it has to be, be a fantasy, and I'd never, I'd never written a fantasy. I had written a couple of sort of popular books uh, some years ago, many years ago. I wrote a book on the snow goose, which was sorry, sort of a story on the life of the snow goose. And uh, then a few years after that, I wrote one about the life of the sandhill crane. And, and in that story, I began to use characters of children, that is, the children of various cultures. And, and I liked that because it, it enabled me to tell about the cultures of those people through their own children, that is, what the beliefs and what the values of those cultures were through the children of those cultures. And I thought that was a, a useful way to talk about people and about animals. And then uh, about four years ago, my daughter, who's uh, a student at Wesleyan University, and I got to talking about, about books. And, and uh, she was playing a game called Drag uh, Dragons and Dungeons, or Dungeons and, Drag Dungeons and Dragons, okay. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, and obviously I still don't know very much about it. But she brought home some of the materials uh, uh, that she was using for this book, which have various kinds of reference manuals and pictures of, of the kinds of creatures that they deal with, including various kinds of dragons. And I looked at it and it was pretty apparent that the dragons in, in those books really weren't very believable dragons. They didn't uh, uh, have the kind of anatomy that a dragon, if it existed, should have. And so uh, I got to talking with Karen about characteristics of, of dragons and, and, and unicorns because she's very interested in unicorns. So finally I said, uh, well, why don't, why don't you and I do a book about, about animals like dragons and, and unicorns? She, she didn't have a job that summer anyway, and <laughs> so she was looking for something to keep her busy. And so she thought that was a good idea. So we started researching various kinds of, of books we might write. And our first thought, I, I wrote to one of my publishers and said, I'd like to do a book with my daughter. And tentatively, it's going to be called The Animals That Noah Forgot, that is, the animals that never made it on Noah's Ark, and which therefore drowned, presumably, and, and disappeared long ago. And so that was our first plan, including unicorns and all sorts of other things. And so we went down to this library, as a matter of fact, and rummaged through all the, all the books and found, in fact, that there were probably four or five books dealing with mythical animals already in a way that were, was similar, at least, to what what uh, we had thought about doing. And about that time, a, a book called Gnomes came out. I'm sure some of you know it. And uh, that dealt with the life histories of gnomes. And, and so the more I thought about it and talking with, with Karen, the more we thought we should restrict the content and the, and the, and the area of, of that book to just a few kinds of animals and deal with them in a sort of a uh, biological way or in a, in a documentary way. And so, sort of using the Gnomes book as a kind of a general model, we uh, restricted the coverage of the book to, to dragons and, and unicorns. And that was great fun. And I learned a, lot about, uh, learned a lot about dinosaurs, as a matter of fact, because in order to write knowledgeably about dragons, I, I had to look up and, 
and, and do a lot of reading about, about dinosaurs. So I, I w was going to England that year anyway, so I spent some time in the British Museum sketching all of the dinosaurs that they had and bought all the books I could find about dinosaurs. Learned really more about dinosaurs than we could put in, into that book, quite frankly. So I ended up with a sort of a residue of information about, about dinosaurs that I thought I could use someday. And then about uh, two years ago, I always go out to the field station. We have a field station in western Nebraska. I always go out and spend four or five weeks out at our biological station teaching. And, and two years ago, I went out there without any real plans for doing research, as we're usually expected to do. But I wanted to do some popular writing, so I told the director, John Janovey, I'm going to uh, spend my, my five weeks out here writing a shaggy dragon story, was what I described it as. And I wondered whether he'd mind, and he said, oh no, that's fine, that sounds like a great idea. So indeed, I started the story out there. I wrote the first two or three chapters um, and was quite pleased with it, but then the end of summer came along and I got caught up in schoolwork and, and I just simply set it aside. This was a, was a year ago, two, two, two summers ago. Um, then that fall, I, I had a little health problem that put me into the hospital for about a week or so and required me to stay out of work for uh, five weeks thereafter and uh, I really needed to do something waiting to go back to work and so I thought one of the things I can do is finish that story I started and so uh, that's how the last four or so chapters came to be written I was sitting at home and I had a computer that I would recently bought and I had to learn how to use the computer anyway so it seemed as if this was a good way to uh, practice on, on writing with the computer. So it turns out the, the last about four chapters of the book were, were done on a computer. As a matter of fact, the original manuscript is here. I gave it to the library. So if any of you want to see what an original book manuscript looks like, um, I, I suspect it could be pulled out. So that was how the, the story came to be written. The drawings, of which there are two out of, I think, something like seven or so that were done for the book, were done by a good friend of mine by the name of Jim McClellan, who teaches uh, art out at Union College. He had done some painting for me a few years ago. And uh, uh, so, and at the time he did that, he said, if you ever do any more writing of a more popular nature, I'd be really interested in, in illustrating it for you. So I remember that, and, and when I finished this manuscript, I gave a copy of it to Jim and, and asked him if he'd consider illustrating it. And, and he was delighted to do so. so. So all of the pencil drawings and pencil pen drawings on the inside, except for some small Indian sort of motifs, are by him. The dust jacket is by n neither by him nor by me. I, it was a local artist who was just hired to do the dust jacket, and I don't happen to know his name. Well, let's, before we get on to the books, let's talk a little bit about, about dinosaurs. I brought over some, I brought over some models of dinosaurs. I want to see things. Does anybody know what this is? This is the longest, yeah, what's, Diplodocus, yeah, that's terrific. How many others knew that? Wow, that's tremendous. Does anybody know what Diplodocus means? I bet you don't. In fact, I had to look it up yesterday, because I didn't know. <laughs> it, die means, means two, as in all sorts of things that start with the die. And it refers to two struts that are on the bottom of the tail had such a long tail, each of the vertebrae, each of the individual vertebrae had its own tail, had two spreads going down, which sort of served as skids, so that when this long tail right along the ground, it didn't get too abraded. So that's, that's how they named it the product. But this is the, probably the longest dinosaur that ever lived. It's probably what, 80 feet long or something like that. All of these, these uh, models are to scale, by the way, so uh, they give you some ideas about it. Does anybody know what it ate? Yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah. Almost all of the really big dinosaurs were kind of years. And many of the really big ones spent a lot of time waiting uh, because they simply had, were so heavy they couldn't possibly uh, get around that line. Can't hear me? Oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> um, in any case, this this is one of the very longest, maybe the very longest of all of all of the dinosaurs and a, and a plant-eating one at that. Now, maybe the heaviest. Perhaps the 
heaviest of all the dinosaurs was this one. Anybody know what that one was? Bron Brontosaurus, you say? No. <laughs> Close. Brachiosaurus, yeah. A lot like, uh, a lot like Brontosaurus, actually, but even a bit bigger. Brachiosaurus, who knows anybody that knows what Brachiosaurus means? What? Do you know what it means, Brachiosaurus? No, no, brachy means arm. It refers to saurus as lizard. And so brachiosaurus, I'm not sure if it's because of its very long, heavy legs or whether it was a leg bone that was first discovered, but brachiosaurus means, means uh, arm lizard. Yeah. Do you know why it breathed out of the top of its head? Well, I was going to just ask that. <laughs> you, you can't answer that. <laughs> who, who knows? Yeah, you back there again. Yeah. Yeah. See, there are people who know more about dinosaurs than I. But yeah. what about the other ones? How come they didn't have anything? The, the other ones that were in the, the water? Yeah, the good question. This is the one, in fact, you can see this little knob on the top of, sort of between the eyes. It's, it's sort of like a hippo, or many of the whales, of course, have blowholes, too. But hippos have noses that stick up like this. Uh, I don't know, that's a good question, but, but certainly this one did, and that's the best explanation for it. It probably weighed in the range of maybe 30 or 40 tons. It was incredibly big. Yeah? But this one's just too, too slow, it might be, yeah, it may be, I don't know. But it's very interesting that it had this big, big knob. Okay, well, we got have those to identify. This is a tough one, unless you, you, you probably won't, won't get this, but who wants to guess what this is? Yeah. Megasaurus. Yeah, Megalosaurus, that's close enough. Did you know it too? Yeah, yeah. Tyrannosaurus rex is, is a little bigger than this, but it, but it, it looks just about like this. Uh, this. Who knows what Megalosaurus means? Anybody can want to make a guess? You know what Megadollars is? <laughs> <laughs> Megalomania, yeah. Yeah, a very yeah. This was the first dinosaur that was ever discovered, and so Megalosaurus means means large lizard. And uh, but it you see by comparison, uh, isn't nearly as large as some of the, the last ones or some of the other ones that were found. This this one is something like twenty or so feet long. It tells on the bottom if you can if you can read it. Uh, but anyway, it would be about twenty twenty feet long. And this what's different about this one than the first two? <laughs> You've answered. Who, oh, let's see, you, okay. This one is Yeah, exactly. It's got long teeth and, and fairly <laughs> small front legs, but it's got tremendously long teeth. In Tyrannosaurus, the, the teeth were about six inches long, and I expected this one almost, because this is about two-thirds or three-quarters the size of Tyrannosaurus. So this was a meat-eater, yeah, and it probably ate other, other dinosaurs. That would have been the main food available for it. And it ran two-legged. It ran on its, its hind legs, and it probably used this tail as a sort of a counterbalance. In any case, it was a very, very mean animal, and uh, uh, wouldn't have been much fun to me. <laughs> now, everybody knows, or how many know what this one is? <laughs> Lots of people know what that one is, yeah. Okay, does anybody know what it means, Stegosaurus? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, recently people have been sort of arguing about whether these, these things stood up straight in the air as <laughs> or, or what. <laughs> well, I was just going to say something about the tail. There's also been some arguing going on about whether it had two brains or not one in its tail or one in its head. Yeah, there's, there was a very large, relatively large, because these animals didn't have very big brains, but there was a ganglion, which is a big mass of neurons. The base of the tail, which was almost as large as, as the one in the head, and so that controlled the movements, presumably of the tail. I imagine it flat, it lashed its tail back and forth to protect itself. 
because that would have been about its only protection. It didn't, it, since it was a, a grass or a vegetation eater, it, it really had very, very small teeth, and probably that was the only way it could protect itself. Yeah. There was also a wild animal, something I don't know if you had to say that it's true that it simply had to have grown pretty far in the heat to find plants and things. They were wondering if those were also absorption of the sun. Yeah, that's the point that I thought he was going yeah. to make, that, that these probably were related to thermal regulation, yeah. And that they may not have always stood up, but they might have sometimes actually been sort of flat down on the back, which would have made them look like, like roofs or shingles of roofs. But anyway, Stegosaurus is the animal that I decided to use in, in the book. And last time I talked to a school group, people asked me why I used that, why I used that lizard. And I did it for about, well, about three reasons. One is that it was a plant eater. I didn't want to have a baby Tyrannosaurus and having <laughs> to figure out how this kid could deal with a baby Tyrannosaurus. So I thought it should be a meat eater. Or I thought it should be a, a plant eater rather than a meat eater. It shouldn't be too large. I, I wanted the thing to be small enough so that the baby probably was no more than 12 or 15 inches long. And we don't know exactly how long babies of these were, but there was a smaller relative of this where the eggs were found and babies coming out of the eggs. Anybody know what that one was? Pro Oh, what? No, Protoceratops? Yeah, it was found in... Yeah. Did, did they really find? Oh, yeah. Well, fossils. Okay. I mean, fossils. <laughs> but they found, they found a number of dinosaur eggs, and these, these Protoceratops were found hatching out a little clutch of them, just like a bird nest. And so they saw the you know, fossil babies coming out of the eggs. Yeah. I've heard there's also discussion about whether there are still dinosaurs on the Pygmy Island, they photographed the Pygmy Brontosaurus. On, on what island? Pygmy Island. Pygmy Island. In Africa. Well, these stories do crop up occasionally. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. I heard something about something in the Caribbean, something on the edge of the Caribbean, that they found some sort of fish that was in the Oh, something. yeah. Well, yeah, it's amazing how these stories do crop up. And in our book on, on dragons and unicorns, we actually plotted in all the locations where various kinds of dragons have been reported. And those, so those dots on the map are real dots. And, and they, it's possible. It's possible, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the most, the most likely and the most common is monster. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there are records of lake dwelling dragons or lizards or whatever beyond Loch Ness in Africa and in various parts of the U.S. Yeah. Right, oh yeah, it's got a special name, the Lake Champlain one does, as do a lot of them. But I, I said I, there were several reasons. Another reason I used this one was that it did occur in Wyoming. Do you have a question back there? The Komodo dragon? Yeah, the Komodo dragon is the largest of the living lizards. It's up to about 10 or 12 feet long, and it weighs about 200 pounds or so. And it's in the East Indies. I think it's the island of Komodo. I'm not sure. It's one of the small islands in the East Indies. And it, it eats almost anything. It'll, it'll eat animals as large as pigs, and there have been a few cases of, of it actually killing children. It's very fast and very dangerous. It's one of the lizards that has forked tongues, like, like snakes do, and it's the biggest of that, that group of lizards. There are a few zoos that have Komodo dragons. I've seen them at the Bronx Zoo in New York and at the San Diego Zoo, but, uh, but they're very dangerous. Uh, I can't hear. What, what she's saying? Oh yeah, they use it for yeah. That's that's why they have the forked tongue. That's why snakes have forked tongues because they stick the tongue out and they literally smell the air and they stick it in their mouth and there are two little pits on the palate on the upper part of the mouth and they they stick these ends of the tongue into the pits and they're they're, they're olfactory detectors. That means a, a chemical detectors. So so they're literally tasting the air when when they're sticking their tongues out. And only one small group of lizards has forked tongues. Most lizards don't and all snakes do. So that's quite right. But anyway, you get back to the 
the story. Uh, I wanted, I wanted to use an, an animal, a, a drag or a dinosaur, uh, which occurred in Wyoming, because I wanted to set the story in part in Wyoming. I spent a lot of time out in, in the Tetons and a little bit of time in Yellowstone. And Yellowstone, of course, is very intriguing. I, I first went there as a child, and, and it's, there's so much wilderness there that there could indeed be animals there which uh, could escape detect and detection. And another thing about Yellowstone is it has a lot of hot springs and all vol volcanic activity. And, and one can imagine, at least I can imagine, that there could be some craters that would have stayed warm for not only centuries, but eons, right through the Pleistocene, right through the a Ice Age. And so I thought, gee, since, since dinosaurs are cold-blooded, and since they presumably became extinct during the, as, as the temperatures got colder, if, if one or more of them lived in one of these craters, then they could probably survive cold weather. So I thought that would be the, the optimum place to look for, for uh, a dinosaur. And the stegosaurus was one of the later, it wasn't the latest dinosaurs, but it was one of the, the later dinosaurs. And so that was the final reason for using a stegosaurus. Triceratops occur even later on than, than stegosaurus. But, but I thought this was cuter, frankly, than triceratops. And so I decided to use it. And uh, the boy in the book, there are two children in the book. There is a boy, his name is Jerry, and I just literally pulled that out of, out of the sky when I was I started to type and I needed a boy's name. I don't have any relatives named Jerry. Uh, it just seemed like a good sort of American name. So I used Jerry. And uh, uh, the boy is really modeled on, on my own son, Scott, who was, was and is a great rock collector. He literally collected everything imaginable from bird's nest to feathers to, to rocks to you name it. If you could get it through the door, it was worth collecting. <laughs> and so, so the description of, of Jerry in, in the first chapter is really a description of, of, of Scott. And uh, out, in, out in Yellowstone, I, uh, although you're not supposed to pick up rocks or anything else in the park, I noticed that up around Mammoth Hot Springs, there were a number of really quite pretty yellowish, yellowish rocks, which are the result of, of this volcanic type activity. And it struck me that some of those rocks were, were nice and rounded with water, and they looked almost like fossilized eggs. And so, so the prospect for a story obviously came along, the idea that a boy might pick up one of these rounded rocks, thinking it was a rock, then he would add it to his collection, and that, uh, in fact, it was, it was an egg of a dinosaur. In Dragons and Unicorns, Karen and I had described dragon eggs very carefully, and uh, I had described them as being six or seven inches long and very glass-like. They take about 100 years to hatch because they're very, very thick. And uh, uh, they are sort of a golden yellow, I said. And indeed, that sort of fit the, the general color of the, many of the rocks in Yellowstone. So it seemed to me that, that one could generate a story based on a boy bringing home what he thought was a rock from Yellowstone Park and, and indeed having it turn out to be the egg of, of a dinosaur. And then the question is uh, what he does with it. And, and my, one of my purposes in writing the book was to try to uh, show the value of wild animals in the wild. In other words, wild animals best belong in the wild. And so if, if Jerry could somehow return this animal to where it belonged, that would be uh, illustrative, as it were, of, of, of the importance of letting rare animals be in the wild rather than turning it over to a zoo or to a zoology department or something like that. And so the, the story became a kind of a quest, the, the quest being, the goal being to return this animal to where it came from. And the other thing I wanted that book to be about was the contrast of, of culture and, and, and abilities in the children of, of two different cultures, namely the Indian culture and, uh, and the contemporary white culture. I grew up in a town where there was an Indian school, and a lot of the kids I knew were, were full-blooded Indians, and, and, I, and I'm part Indian myself, as a matter of fact. So I've always been intrigued by, entranced by Indians and Indian culture and the Indian way of looking at, at the world and, and realizing that, it's, that one can perceive reality in many different ways. So I wanted to introduce a, a, a girl into the story who was as important as the boy and who brought in uh, 
with her brought in abilities that the boy didn't have. And so uh, the other major character, if you will, is the other major human character in the book, is a Cheyenne Indian girl who is raised on a reservation in southeastern Montana near Lame Deer. That's the current home of the Northern Cheyenne. They've been there since so oh, shortly after the, the Custer defeat. They were consigned to this obscure reservation in southeastern Montana. And at one time, they virtually owned the, the Western Plains from Western Nebraska through almost all of Eastern Wyoming and up into, they were as, as powerful a tribe as the Sioux were a bit farther east and, and were really masters of the plains. And, and they brought with that culture tremendous knowledge of, of the wildlife of the plains. And luckily, um, a lot is known about the Cheyennes. Uh, George Bird Grinnell, who was a well-known biologist, anthropologist, went up into the Cheyenne Reservation in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and did a very thorough sort of study of the Cheyennes and published it in several volumes. And so when I decided to, to bring an Indian girl into the picture, really it should have been Cheyenne, and as soon as I found this book, it became possible to do enough reading to, to make sure that what I wrote about this girl was, was accurate. And in order to make her a sort of a traditional Cheyenne, I decided that, that she would be raised in the Cheyenne tradition by her grandmother, not her mother, and uh, decided that her mother would have uh, left that reservation, gone off to marry a, a sort of a cowhand, if you will, in the Wind River area, which is a, an Arap I believe it's an Arapaho reservation. And so this, this little girl is who I, I called uh, Tommy, Tommy and Jerry, the sort of Tom and Jerry kind of thing. It seemed like a good, a good match. Uh, Thomasina is her Christian name, but she also had a, an Indian name. Uh, so I wanted her to be raised in the, uh, in the Indian culture and, and look at the world in the, in the Indian or the Cheyenne manner. So those are, the, those are the main characters. There's a dog, there's a dog in the book who, who uh, is called Pal. Pal was the name of the first dog I remember having. It was, it was a mongrel, just like Pal in this book is. The, the dog that was drawn to represent Pal by Jim is a bit bigger. It's sort of a, sort of a, almost a collie-sized dog, but, but my Pal was much smaller than that. In any case, I decided there should be a dog in there to, to help out. And I also decided there should be a snake, like, like lizards. Snakes aren't looked upon very uh, well by most people, and so I thought it'd be nice to, to bring in a pet snake. And the hog-nosed snake is a, is a very sort of benevolent snake. It's non-poisonous, and and if it gets frightened, it'll turn over and play dead. And when it's trying to th threaten you, it'll shake its tail like a rattlesnake. Well, when it's all bluff. And so, uh, so I thought there ought to be a, a, a snake in there too, and, and a bird. And interestingly, I thought immediately there ought to be a, um, a magpie, because a magpie is one of the, one of the prettiest of, of the Western birds. And so I wrote it in as a magpie, uh, when the story was read, I think it was Virginia, was it you who pointed out uh, that the magpie is not likely to be found nesting around here? Some, one of the readers, and I knew that, of course, but I didn't think anybody else would know that. <laughs> and as soon as it was pointed out that somebody else had noticed it, I decided it better be changed to Blue Jay. And so uh, I changed the manuscript to Blue Jay, and the more I thought about it, the more I didn't like Blue Jay. But by that time, Jim McClellan had already drawn the first drawing, namely the boy looking over his rock collection with his dog and a blue jay. And so I finally decided I was just going to have to change the, the section on how the boy uh, got the bird. He got it out around Grand Islands, where Mag Grand Island, where magpies are reasonably common, rather than here in the eastern part of the state. And so I, when I told Jim that, he said, well, it's already drawn as a blue jay, but I can... I can paste over a magpie. And so if you look very closely at the, this first picture, you'll see that the magpie is actually pasted on. It was a, there's a blue jay hiding underneath there. And uh, so that's how that came about. But I, I really did want it to be a magpie, and uh, partly because it's a, a more interesting and a sort of a more typical Western bird. Well, let, let me uh, read the first... Uh, a couple of paragraphs, it'll sort of set the, the time and then I can 
and I can get back to sort of the, the why and wherefore, why and wherefore, wherefore. The exact time is unimportant. It was sometime after the age of reptiles and prior to the Third World War. The place was far enough to the north that the constellation of Draco the Dragon never disappeared below the horizon. Draco the Dragon sort of entwines around the North Pole, and the North Pole stays at the same, uh, the North Star, Polaris, uh, and the Draco sort of spins around the North Pole all the time, and when you're far to the south, then the North Pole Star drops down to the horizon, and so the farther south you go, the greater the probability is that Draco will disappear under the, under the horizon at night, but when you're at this latitude, it stays above the horizon throughout the year. So it, it was far enough to the north that the constellation of Draco the Dragon never disappeared below the horizon, even during the darkest and coldness of winter nights. Far enough to the south that lizards and snakes could sun themselves for months on end through the luxuriously hot Nebraska summers. More precisely, the place was a small town situated on the west bank of the Missouri River, a river with the infinitely good sense to totally and unequivocally separate the states of Iowa and Nebraska for all of their common distance. I was thinking specifically of, of Weeping Water, mainly because Weeping Water is, is about the only town where there's an outcrop of limestone nearby, which has a lot of fossils. And I used to take Scott over to Weeping Water and look for fossils there. And so it seemed to me that, that uh, Weeping Water would be a good place to, uh, to set it. I didn't identify the town, but a few weeks ago, I by chance happened to meet, meet a school teacher who was from Weeping Water. And she asked me, she said, I and my class have been reading your book and we've been wondering if the town is anywhere neeping, near Weeping Water. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, it is Weeping Water. <laughs> and she was very excited. She said that only two books had been written. This was, this was my, the second book that had been written about Weeping Water. The first one was a sort of an expose of, of the town, kind of a patent place. And the poor guy who wrote it was driven out of town on, on the rail after it appeared. So she was very pleased that something <laughs> nice had finally been written about weaving water. So I went over there and talked to her class about, about dragons and, and uh, things like this. And she was very, very tickled about that. Actually, to go on, the place was the small bedroom of a small, town, of a small house in a small town on the west bank of the Missouri River. The town had been founded in the optimistic period of the Great Westward Depression and forgotten in the in the Great Western Expansion and forgotten in the years of the Great Depression. The house itself was nearly 80 years old and seemed destined to soon disappear under the weight of the vines that lovingly clung to its clapboard walls. That description is really uh, of the house that I was born in, and a few years ago I went back to the little town in North Dakota and, and saw the house where, where I spent my first few years, and it by that time was a fully 80 years old and about to collapse. Uh, but but basically the, the house is a description of, of our house in a small town in North Dakota. The bedroom had long since been left by the parents of the boy who slept in it to its own manifest destiny after finding they could no longer enter it without fear of being growled at by the dog, by the boy's dog, Paul, pal, stepping on a hog-nosed snake half hidden under the various floor debris that was partly the result of gravity and partly of design, or receiving a bird dropping in their hair from the boy's pet magpie. I never had a pet magpie. I did have a, a pet uh, sparrowhawk for many years, and, and so uh, the magpie is more or less the equivalent of my pet sparrowhawk. Although they were no means experts in, this ma in such matters, they firmly believed that the boy's bedroom probably represented the lowest geographical point on the North American continent, and that given enough time, virtually all movable objects would eventually assemble at that point. Uh, that that room is also sort of my room as a child, but especially Scott's room, <laughs> as it still exists. <laughs> He's gone off to graduate school, but his rocks are still at home. <laughs> um, the boy then picks up this rock on a trip out to Yellowstone, and it's a lovely rounded golden rock, adds it to, to his rock collection, and uh, he picks it up one summer. And uh, late the following winter, he realizes that it's cracking and first thinks that perhaps it's the humidity or the heat of the house or something that's causing it to crack. But, but in fact, of course, it's, it's actually the egg hatching out and soon he discovers that he has a baby stegosaurus. And uh, so then the, the problem is uh, what to do with it. And as I said, he finally decides, you yeah, know, Uh, 
Oh, I, yeah, I think they're probably like bird eggs. I've, I've looked at lizard eggs and, and turtle eggs, and they, they're just sort of grayish. There's no color on them. And none of the reptile eggs I've ever seen were, have been colored. They're softer shelled, however, at least the ones I know. And so in that way, this is probably not a very accurate description. But I almost had to make it very hard and rock-like so that the boy would confuse it with a rock. But, uh, but generally, they're thinner shelled than, than bird eggs. And they're often more rounded rather than elongated. Yeah. Well, the, it becomes clear later on that, that it's not really a fossil. The, the parents and grandparents, etc., there's been a continuous line of stegosaurs living in the, the wilderness of Yellowstone all these years. And so, so the, the, the egg is not truly a fossil, uh, but is, is simply, a, if you will, a newly, ha a newly laid egg. And the boy actually finds it in a crater. This, this mother stegosaur is living in a crater and the egg happens to sort of roll out of her nest and, and this boy is investigating this crater and sees this beautiful rounded rock and decides to, to take it home. So it's not, not a fossil egg, uh, but is a, is a fresh egg. But that is a problem, the, the fact that, that I think most dinosaur eggs were probably not nearly as hard as, as I've described them. They could have been, yeah. When they, they could have, sure. If they lived in very dry areas, they would probably have to be pretty hard so they didn't dry out. That's one reason turtles lay their eggs under the sand so they stay sort of moist. Indeed, nearly all reptiles that do still lay eggs do that. Um, so then he, uh, he decides to take this, this thing back out to, to Yellowstone, not telling his parents about it. I, that was a kind of a difficult decision. Obviously his parents wouldn't have let him go and so I, I was sort of forced to make the boy do something that, that little boys or little girls for that matter shouldn't do, namely take off on a, on a dangerous trip without telling uh, his, his parents where he was going. But I was sort of forced into that and a few other kinds of decisions uh, that probably aren't the best role models for, for boys. Now, the second or third chapter starts with the, uh, the, st the story of the little girl, and I've almost used up all my time, but let me just tell you a little bit about her, and then, then uh, maybe there'll be t some time for questions. This is a Cheyenne girl, and, and as, uh, I'll just read the first uh, paragraph or two. She was very much like any other full-blooded Cheyenne 13-year-old, with hair the color of raven's wings, eyes as brown as ripe chestnuts, and skin of a warm olive-brown tone that reflected centuries of life on the high plains of western North America. It's perhaps an overstatement to say that she was pretty, faded jeans and an old oversized plaid shirt that she found one day at a church rummage sale tended to obscure the fact that she had beautifully high cheekbones and a posture as erect and straight as a war lance. The only obvious reference to her Indian heritage was a bead necklace that she wore hidden under her shirt and a magpie feather that she found one day and had inserted into her tightly braided hair. Uh, really, the description is of a, is of a, a cousin of mine uh, that, uh, since I was part Indian, it turned out this cousin was, was substantially more, in, more Indian than I. She was probably half Indian. It was the same age as I. In fact, I guess when I was 12 or 13, I probably had a kind of a crush on her. I'm not sure, but I always thought she was about as pretty as any girl could be. Uh, and so, so the description of the girl is, is pretty much based on that rather than any specific Indian. And uh, I also describe her, her grandmother. And a fair amount of, of Indian folklore, I wanted to bring in quite a number of authentic myths and, and folklore about animals, some of which make, in a sense, uh, make real sense and others are just interesting. But basically, these two kids meet in Casper, Wyoming, I think it is, where she's headed on down south. She wants to get to the Wind River Range to meet her mother, and, and uh, the boy is, of course, headed west. And he, he takes off on his bicycle. He makes his little wagon into a sort of a Conestoga wagon and puts the, uh, puts the little stegosaurus in it, and he takes along the hognose snake and the, the magpie. So a little sort of a team of of uh, creatures take off 
And uh, to make a long story short, they do indeed eventually get, uh, get the stegosaur back into the, into the cavern where, where the mother was. In the process, they're afraid that the dog pal gets killed by the mother stegosaurus because he disappears as, the, as there's an apparent attack on, on this boy as he's returning the baby stegosaur, and, and, and Pal just disappears. One reason he almost had to disappear was that there really wasn't room for him on the raft. I decided they were going to escape down the Yellowstone on a little two-man life raft, and it's hard enough, I've been on, on those, and it's really hard enough for one, one person to be in a two-man life raft to say nothing of two kids and a big dog. And so I was almost forced to leave him out, and, and uh, initially I decided that, that perhaps the dog would be sacrificed. But several people reading the manuscript were very upset about that, and so then I decided that he would be refound after the kids are found. They discover that the dog has sort of wandered on down to, to a Mammoth and been found by the rangers, so he's, he's all right. Eventually, of course, they... They do get back home. They, they take the Yellowstone River as, about as far as they can, and, and in fact it flows more or less uh, near the uh, Indian Reservation where the Cheyenne girl lives, and so she gets off there. And about that time, they are discovered by, by the police and, in a sense, picked up. And so uh, at that point in time, the story is essentially over. The boy uh, goes back home, under, as it were, under police protection, and, and the girl goes back to her home, and uh, uh, the boy gives the girl his pet magpie, and the girl gives the boy her uh, her necklace, her bead necklace. Uh, actually, the original the original story I wrote, I left it like that. Then then I decided, well, this this is really a little hard to a little hard to swallow. So I wrote a short epilogue, which suggested the whole thing was really a dream, and sent that over to the publisher after the manuscript, and he read it and decided it, it really wasn't very good. <laughs> and I was having second thoughts about it, too. I think you have to accept the fact that it is a fantasy, and why not make it uh, uh, not, a, not a dream, but a real fantasy. And so we, we left that, that epilogue out. Anyway, that's, that's the story. We've used up about 45 minutes, which is what I was told I should, should spend. Now, any questions about uh, the story or anything else about writing a book? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I've never met her. She was here autographing books a few years ago, and and her books are among the favorite of my daughters. And I haven't read any of her books, but thank you. Any other? The name of the book is Prairie Children, Mountain Dreams. A few people have said, what's the mountain dreams? Well, both these kids are dreaming about the mountains. The girl is dreaming about going to the Wind River Range and seeing her mother, and the boy is dreaming about going to Yellowstone and returning this animal to its, its rightful place. And so they're both children of the prairie, but, but in their dreams and wishes, they want to go out to the mountains. Um... Any other uh, questions or, or um, comments? I want to do another children's book, and I'm toying around with all sorts of different ideas, and I, I really don't know what, what it's going to be just yet. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I like to be working on a popular book at the same time I'm working on some more serious ones. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not a real fantasy. I'm not going to use any unlikely... Uh, I'd like to do, again, a kind of a cultural comparison, and I'm thinking about something that would tie in Halley's Comet as it, as it occurred 75-odd years ago and something that may have happened sort of the life of maybe my parents or grandparents on the North Dakota prairie that time, and then and then talk about another quite different thing. I'm going to Africa in about a week or ten days, and we'll be spending the Christmas period out on the Serengeti uh, in, in Kenya and hopefully see some Maasai. And about that time, Halley's Comet should be visible. And I'd kind of like to do a, a story which t talks about a, a, a Maasai child and him or her seeing that, that comet and you know, sort of making a cycle in time. I don't know whether that's going to work, frankly, but uh, 
that's what I'm thinking about now, among other things. Any other, uh, any other questions? Uh, well, I've been looking forward to it for a long time, and oh, <laughs> thank you, John. Anything else? Well, thank you very, very much for your attention. I enjoyed it. I'm quite impressed by the knowledge of some of your kids. Thank you.